Hey, Mark Webb. Yes. Uh, I know that I am in the minority regarding time zones, but yes. but maybe every once in a while, could the the hospitality suite start like just two hours earlier, so I it's midnight, not two a.m. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean uh, that that is. <laughs> I, I think what we need to do is kind of uh, host uh, rotating uh, time zone hospitality suites. So uh, maybe we'll look at putting up one that starts at a reasonable hour for Europe and see how that goes. That uh, would be did, helpful for Japan and Australia too. I would really be uh, thankful if, if you are there uh, because my, my multiple languages uh, skills are very, very low. So I can pretty much say hello and thank you. And, just just drink a glass of wine or something you'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> so less a hospitality suite and more like an early bird happy hour yeah well there you go i mean you're all in your homes right mimosa day, day brunch day, day drinking i think i need my weekend <laughs> through drinking. all of my webinars so <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's right about 12.05-ish. Uh, so we're, we still have a, a few people that are uh, uh, coming into the room, but we do have uh, quite a, a packed schedule this afternoon. Um, so we have presentations today from Kat Hunt from the Ingram Planetarium. Yay. So Kat, can you wave and say hi? So you, you, you'll see her. Um, we have uh, Ken Brandt uh, from North Carolina, Robeson, uh, formerly of the Robeson Planetarium, but future of the Robeson Planetarium. Good enough. Uh, uh, we've got, oh, now I've got other people that I'm now forgetting. Um, we had Kat, we had Brian Kohler. How can I, how can I ever forget Brian Kohler? Um, and then two new, new uh, parts today. Uh, we're gonna have Mike Smale from Adler Planetarium and Mary Holt from Cal Academy are gonna be providing us with some, um, some fun, sort of non-astronomy updates that I think will help make the e-conferences even more enjoyable uh, as we move forward. Uh, but for those of you who this is your first time at one of the e-conferences, welcome. Uh, for everyone else, welcome back. Uh, what we'd like to do real quick before we jump into the presentations uh, is to go real quick over uh, just a reminder of this is a professional setting. Uh, and so how we moderate and how we deal with questions and queuing things of that sort. Uh, if you are a participant, which is now everybody except for me, you have the ability to raise your hand in the participants list. So uh, for those of you who've done that before, go ahead and just kind of raise your hand uh, so that we can see it up there. In the there we go. So Brian's raised his hand. And All right, perfect. As you raise your hand, you go to the very top of my participants list, and that allows me to queue up our questions really effectively. Uh, and so then we'll, we'll get everybody where we need to go let you unmute and you can answer uh, or ask your questions. Same thing with the group chat. Everybody's been watching that the whole time. Uh, anything you wanna say in there, any questions you have, we're gonna pay attention to that and make sure that we have both. Um, otherwise, and you can you know put your hands down if you want to. Uh, it is with papers and workshops, it's the same thing as it would be at a, a regular conference. All questions are open. Our, our, uh, our presenters, of course, are here because they really, really want to, uh, and they've got plenty to share. And so we're, we're excited to have you all out today. A um, little bit of housekeeping. We have, this is kind of a packed week when it comes to conferences and online stuff. Uh, to let you know, next week, we're probably going to end up doing just one e-conference. And then if Mark wants to do a, a kind of an extended happy hour hospitality suite, we'll probably do that and kind of have one week on where we've got a, a bit more and maybe a week off where we can get kind of uh, catch our breath a little bit. Uh, so this week we have our e-conference today. Uh, tomorrow is a special seminar at night before the hospitality suite uh, about utilizing some of the more advanced capabilities of Zoom and combining it with a, a few other free programs to do some really amazing live online streaming presentations. Um, there's a, some guys hosting it. It's fine. It's like, he's, he's pretty good at what he does. Uh, and then Friday, of course, we've got another conference, 
Uh, that's going to be really exciting. Uh, Carrie Berglund from Digitalis, who of course uh, helped to found Lips, has really kind of kept that going now for, for most of the past 10 years. We're gonna try our first Lips style presentation on, on Friday, which is gonna involve breakout groups and small group work uh, and, and really kind of try something new uh, than what we've done here the, the first couple of times. So hope that you guys can, can attend all that. And of course, Thursday night, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern, 3 a.m. Central European time uh, is uh, the second of the virtual hospitality suites. Uh, we're gonna have trivia this time. I don't know if you'll win anything, but you will, if you win, have the uh, respect of your colleagues and peers across the world. So um, in some cases that's that's better than anything else. Uh, so just making sure here, uh, we are recording and live streaming right now out to YouTube. So for those uh, of you who see this a little bit later, thank you for streaming and tuning in. Um, and then we've got a few ideas kind of uh, percolating for the next few weeks, but at least right now we've got a lot going. And of course, if we start early, that means we give our presenters just a little bit more time uh, and that works out pretty well. So our first presenter today uh, is going to be Catherine Hunt. Uh, she is the would you, you're the director? Uh, planetarium manager, technically speaking. She is the planetarium lady in Sunset Beach, North Carolina. She runs the Ingram Planetarium. Uh, if you've never met Kat in person, you have not fully fulfilled your life's destiny. So um, we have probably the most bubbly trio of people you can imagine for presentations today. Uh, and so without further ado, Kat, we'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you for presenting today. Thank you. Um, and forgive me, I've never used screen share before. So hopefully this will go okay. I'm going to um, stream my PowerPoint. Can everyone see that okay? Affirmative. Awesome. Okay. Yay. I did it successfully. All right. So my session today is about super simple graphic design and image editing for the planetarian. Um, and I started developing this because I know a lot of sites, they don't have necessarily the ability um, to get really robust programs like Adobe Photoshop, or maybe they're intimidated by them. They don't have a lot of graphic design experience. Um, but there are a lot of simple graphic design techniques you can do right with Microsoft Suite. Um, and there's a couple of other um, online programs that are free or very inexpensive that you can use as well. So I'm doing a more of an introduction piece for the e-conference, but I'm going to share more in-depth tutorial videos in the um, conversation space in this event so that you can watch them on your own time because there's about an hour and a half worth of content there and I knew that wouldn't fit well in this particular setting. Um, so what this is not, we're not going to talk about Photoshop at all just to say that it's not about Photoshop at all. So if you're wanting more Photoshop trainings, not this particular session or my videos, there are a lot of things you have to use things like Photoshop to do but there's a lot of different um, graphic design techniques you can use that are very simple without any of these really complicated, um, robust programs. So you will learn how to use um, affordable and accessible software to make graphics. Uh, you'll learn how to make uh, appealing graphics in Microsoft Suite, mostly Publisher and PowerPoint. The functionality in those two are pretty much the same, so you can use either or. And most people, if you have Microsoft Suite, you're gonna have both of them. Um, but if you don't, you can use PowerPoint for a lot of it. Um, you'll learn how to do some basic photo edits that look really good in the dome, but can also look good in some of the online materials that you're going to be creating over the next couple of weeks. You'll also be introduced to Adobe Spark and Canva, which are web-based platforms. And I'm gonna go into some basic aesthetic principles as well. So the first one that I'm gonna introduce you to is Word Art. This is all done in Microsoft Suite. Now these fonts, all of these fonts with the exception of the very top one are not fonts that are inside Microsoft. You do have to go outside to get some of these. 
Um, you can do a lot of work with the fonts that are already available. There's lots of good fonts in Microsoft, but I like to go out and get some fonts that are unique and different. I like a website called dafont.com, D-A-F-O-N-T.com. Um, do be careful with it though, because fonts actually can be copywritten. So just like art and photos and music, fonts can actually be copywritten as well. So be very mindful of that if you download any fonts, but it's very simple to do. And then you can create really interesting um, word art like the stars at sunset that I have in the middle there. Um, and there are different techniques that you can use to give different coloring schemes and effects. Like I have the glowing letters down at the bottom for Saturday night laser lights. Um, and they're all in Word again. The big key for any of this is when you save the elements, and I delve into this inside the tutorials more, but when you save the elements, it's really important to save them as PNG files. That way you have a transparent background. Then you can take your word art or what other graphics you're making, and you can put them in your uh, dome software if you have digital full domes or you can put them in PowerPoints or other video softwares that you're using to create online content and they're also very stable. So if I create a PowerPoint like I am today with a special font and I email it to you, I will lose that font when I email it to you because you won't have downloaded that font. But if I convert it to a photo file, a PNG file, then it's stable and you can actually see it um, across different systems and across dis different softwares. So the next one is icons and symbols. And I will uh, open for questions at the end, of course. So with icons and symbols, um, very similar thing. Um, I'm putting together different elements. Um, and I'm also telling a message with these. And I'm gonna go forward one, I might backspace a little bit. Um, but for, the, for an example, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar, I'm sure some of you are, of this activity um, from the Night Sky Network. It's um, Life in the Extreme. And it's actually a physical kinesthetic activity that you can do where you give these creature cards to participants and you put the different environmental needs up on a whiteboard or something like that and they move around based on their environmental needs. Well, I wanted to translate that into the full dome so I could do a kinesthetic activity inside the dome. So I created with Publisher the little um, environmental need bars up at the top. And I'm gradiating from light to dark here to show the message of lighter water need to more water need. And I'm also being very um, mindful of consistency um, and that's an aesthetic principle. So the color blue that I make the teardrop, which is a clip art that I recolored in Publisher, that color blue is gonna be the same color blue gradiated inside the water bar. Um, you can also give yourself kind of a backsplash, a visual backsplash if you're speaking. So this um, graphic that you have to the left um, the spherical graphic. That's kind of a play on the Venn diagram. So in this particular graphic, I'm emphasizing the relationship between biology and planetary science to create the interdisciplinary science of astrobiology. Um, so I created a visual representation of that um, using these icons and then kind of doing a play on the Venn diagram. Um, so you can really send messages with graphics as well. Now a little bit about color theory. I'm not gonna go totally into it. You can get into it so deeply where you even infer a certain mood with colors. So just like certain words in the English language or any other language have a mood, colors can too. But for your purposes today, I wanna talk about just some of the basics of color relationship. So if you're not as familiar with complementary colors, there's kind of a really easy way to do it. Um, and I wish I had a laser pointer. I feel naked right now, not being able to use one. <laughs> but if you look at the color wheel over to the left, a safe way to start is to just use opposite colors. So green and red are complementary. The blues and oranges are complementary. The purples and yellows are complementary. 
And you can get a little bit more detail than that, certainly, but that's kind of a good foundation. You can also use hue to create dimension and even in some cases, three dimensional objects. So the hoop, the red hoop on the right, my right, I'm not sure what it looks like for you guys, but the red hoop, um, it is red, but it's different hues of red to make more of a three dimensional object. And I created that very simply in Publisher. I didn't use anything fancy. I just used a gradation feature and an understanding of colors um, and that's all. Now, basic photo editing is next. Um, these are some examples of some of the ways that I edit my photos to put on the full dome. Um, the dome is an interesting environment because it is dome shaped as all of us know. Um, I like to use a lot of round photos there's a big reason for that. There's a great book if you wanna get into it a little bit more called The Aesthetics of Joy. Um, and it talks about what uh, elements of graphics and visuals are um, happy, literally, that kind of infer happiness and make people um, feel pleasant. And round things are very aesthetically pleasing to human beings in general. And it also helps to tone down some of the warping that can happen with full dome images. Um, we all seen where they get very big and then they start to warp a little bit. And there's different ways to deal with that, but you can camouflage it in many cases by using round images instead of square ones. I also will very simply do a, a soft edge on photos as with the square image to the far left, my left. Um, and that, just helps integrate it into the background. I know a lot of you are using different softwares. I'm speaking from a SIDOM perspective, um, but any of the softwares where you can input images over backgrounds, this will help integrate the image into your background a little bit better. So it feels more holistic. It's not a stark contrast which sometimes is good, um, but sometimes you might wanna set the image back a little bit and make it blend in a little bit better. Um, again, with rounded things, uh, that doesn't necessarily have to be completely circular. I will often round the edges of photos as with the um, Apollo astronauts there at the bottom. And sometimes applying a nice reflection under them looks really nice. So those are just a, a few of the very simple, very quick photo edits that make your photo content look more dynamic and appealing. Um, now there's also creative photo editing, and I hope that this executes correctly. A little bit of a backstory in um, one of the programs that I did this for, I wanted to zoom in to the crust features of Europa. Um, and I hope it executes similarly to the way it looks on the dome. So I bring up Europa, a model of Europa in my planetarium software, and then I grow uh, this zooming in of the features and that's an image from NASA, but I'm giving it a different shape. So you can also put photos into different shapes in a publisher or um, PowerPoint as well, which gives them again, a little bit more intrigue, a little bit um, more dynamic. And they don't look like you just plastered photos up on the dome. They look like they're actually part of something a little bit more. And then lastly, I'm gonna introduce you to a couple of programs over the web. Um, there is a lot of functionality with both Adobe Spark and Canva that's completely free. Um, and what functionality does cost is not very expensive. So if you're doing a lot more graphic work, um, you can absolutely um, upgrade that potentially and have a lot more functionality. Um, on the North Carolina Science Festival one, that I made with Canva. Now I like both of these programs for a big reason is they have a lot of very intuitive template sizes already. With Publisher, you kind of have to know measurements to get exact sizes for things. But with both of these newer softwares over the web, they're designed for the social media age. So they have uh, the sizing for Instagram and Facebook and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if you're doing any kind of web content, that's very helpful, but also it can be helpful when converting to the dome. So if you're wanting to make a circular image, for example, it's good to start out with a square image 
because that's going to give you a, a more perfect circle. Whereas if you have a wide image, that's going to give you more of an oval. So if I make my image square to begin with, I know I'm off to a good start um, to get uh, my, my spherical image. Canva is better if you're wanting to use a lot of clip art. They have a pretty extensive um, clip art gallery, both free and paid. And a lot of the clip art, if you want to buy it, is cheap. It's dollar, you know, three dollars maybe if you want to invest in that. If you're wanting to do more photo editing um, and text overlays, Adobe Spark is really good for that. And that's what I made the queen ad with over um, to my right. Um, so those are some really good programs to get into. Again, I'm going to do the more detailed kind of tutorials and introductions in separate videos you can watch on your own. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing. I know it went kind of fast, um, but I wanted to open up for questions. Any questions, I'll pop the text box up, text box up as well. And just remember, if you want to ask questions, make, you can either do that in the chat or raise your hand in the participants window. And I'm not sure if I see the hands raising um, since I'm not the host. So I'll, I'll make sure of that. Okay. Oh, uh, Michelle out in Casper. Uh, if uh, How do we watch your videos later on? Yeah, so I'm going to post them. Um, I didn't post them beforehand because I didn't want it to be confusing and not make any sense, but I'm going to post a Google Drive folder in the event space after this concludes that will have um, a share link for you to download the videos. Uh, and then another question from Carol Holmberg uh, in South Carolina and from the Cape region. Uh, if sh you want to put text on the dome, how do you warp it? I don't do a lot of warping. A lot of times with the text, it just will warp itself and it will look fine, um, especially if you make it large enough. I haven't had an instance where I really wanted to warp it, though there is a function in Publisher where you can take your text and you can manipulate its shape. I didn't cover that in the video that I made, so I might go back and do a small um, addendum at some point this evening for that. Great. All right, any other questions for Kat today? Thanks so well, much. Well, if that's if that's it, uh, thanks, Kat, for uh, for your presentation this morning. And then, of course, if questions do come up at some point, feel free to put them in the event page or reach out to Kat directly, uh, and we'll uh, we'll uh, get those along to her. Thanks, Kat. Uh, now, since we do have a fair amount of time, um, this is kind of a good place where we can put in some filler. Uh, I'm going to briefly turn over uh, the e-conference today to Dana. Um, Dana Thompson and I, uh, as well as a few other people here in the e-conference, are part of IPS's COVID-19 response group. Uh, and we've been tasked with uh, putting together what IPS uh, can do to help the planetarian community uh, uh, with coronavirus and sort of the, the aftermath of what that's, that's how that's affecting our community. So uh, Dana's got a few things to talk about. I'll turn it right over to you. Uh, thank you, Michael. And this is actually kind of a surprise, so um, I'm going to do the best I can. But I'm going to go ahead and just um, link a or put a link for the survey that just came out from IPS President Mark Subarau. And if Mark, you want to join in and add anything, um, since you don't have a cat on your lap, then that would be nice. But um, this form, if you go to it, it is really going to help the IPS, the International Planetarium Society, gain some information about how your planetarium is dealing with or might be affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And so this information that we gain from this um, kind of questionnaire will help guide what the IPS does, as well as give us kind of a sense of how the community is doing uh, which is important when we're trying to do our future projects.
How many of you have uh, filled out the survey already? Thumbs up. Good, thank you. Yeah, we've gotten a pretty good uh, response so uh, so far. Um, about 100 uh, responses. Um, and out of that, it looks like about 98% of the planet, 98 to 99% of the planetariums uh, are closed. Yeah, but everything, um, you know, in addition to filling it out, please, if that you can help share that with others, uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah, to reiterate something that, that um, uh, Michelle has written in the chat is that there are a number of planetarians in our community that do not have access to their work emails currently. Uh, and so if you do have personal connections with planetarians that you know have been, uh, been furloughed or don't have access to, uh, their work networks. Uh, anything that we can do to, to sort of expand the reach of this is great. Um, Patty uh, Seaton, of course, has let us know. Uh, the link for the COVID-19 response form is on the MAPS website as well. Uh, and so if you are uh, a webmaster or a board member of one of the regional conferences, uh, regional organizations, this is a great opportunity uh, for all of us to be reaching out to our memberships uh, and really getting a, a pulse of what's happening in the community. All right. So thanks, Dana. Thanks, Mark. Uh, also, I think it's, uh, it is April 1st. So we do have to, um, we have to do one thing today. And that is wish uh, Mark Subarau a happy birthday. So Mark, happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> and that is not a, that's not a prank. It's actually his birthday. So, um, so given that the next two presenters are renowned in the community for their ability to talk longer than the time given, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think we're in really good shape uh, to turn it over now uh, to Brian Kohler, uh, who runs the Trorgi Planetarium up at uh, the Mystic Seaport Museum in beautiful Mystic, Connecticut. Uh, today's uh, presentation, Brian's got virtual moon faces, lessons learned from my first foray into distance learning. So without further ado, Brian Kohler, everybody. Right, awesome. Thank you, uh, Mike. And thank you, everybody. Um, I, uh, I I don't know what Mike's talking about. I plan on keeping this thing to like 15 minutes tops. No, actually, all joking aside, I'm glad we're moving a little quickly. I will have to um, step out at one o'clock to tackle some other work related stuff. So it's not that I want to like present and then bolt. I really do want to like see what everybody else has. And Kat, thank you for kicking us off. That was really cool. Um, so uh, yeah, I wanted to uh, share with you guys. Eric, can everybody hear me okay? Thumbs up. We're all good. Yeah, okay, super. Um, I have the headphones in and I wanna make sure the mic is picking me up. I'm gonna do a little a screen sharing as well. Um, so let me go ahead and call up my PowerPoint here, which hopefully will actually work in a second. There we go, okay. Um, so I imagine many of you are probably trying and experimenting some kind of virtual programming. And I, I'm certainly not here to say I wrote the book on things, but I have had a very drastic uh, learning curve. There's been a lot of winging it and learning on the fly. And so I just wanted to kind of share my experience and you know, st hopefully start a conversation. And if anybody has similar experiences that want to chime in, then we could kind of keep this thread going and kind of keep uh, sort of supporting each other. Um, and the one thing I've learned that has been burned into my head in the last week or so is that, of course, everything has a context. So um, I do want to not tell a, a sad story, but I want to kind of give you all an idea of how this timeline has been accelerated for me so drastically. Uh, so to give you guys just a little bit of background on the uh, my little quiet little corner of Connecticut, um, it was just two weeks ago, three weeks ago, um, that we were open for business. Everything was looking good. We had our three planetarium shows a day and school groups bringing field trips. Everything was great. Um, on March 11th, we were told that we were closing until further notice. At the time, they gave us this random date of March 30th, uh, which uh, is now, uh, we're now, now learning is not, whoa, sorry, 
little jump there, um, which of course is not actually our reopening date. But at that point, uh, everybody was sent home and they said, we'll pay you through the end of March and your director will be in touch. We'll find some ways for you guys to work from home. Everything will, you know, we'll, we'll kind of kind of manage. Um, so as a part of the education department in our museum, we kind of got together and said to ourselves, all right, what can we do and how can we take the programs we do at our site as well as in our school, kind of convert them into a virtual format. And uh, just over, um, uh, this was March 24th, what are you talking like a week ago? Yeah, eight days ago, uh, I conducted the first uh, virtual moon phases program. And I'll get to more about that in just a little bit. Um, but since we have a Zoom Pro account with a cap of 100 people, we had 100 people, uh, which is good because it tells me that there's a bit of a market for this. And this was just, again, in our little community of schools and teachers who are all at home sitting around trying to figure out how to fill days and dates, days worths of curriculum. Um, so that was March 24th, which amazingly was only eight days ago, even though it feels like it was like three years ago. Um, so uh, the following day, a week ago today, uh, we learned what would soon become public information, which was that uh, the Mystic Seaport Museum was deciding that they had no stream of revenue and their only solution was that they were going to execute uh, sweeping, sweeping layoffs. And they're actually effective today. And that is not a joke. It's April 1st, 5 p.m. At the end of the day today, anybody who got a letter um, is at home and without a job. And uh, to give you an idea of how that affected our corner of the world, um, our education department as of yesterday uh, was made up of somewhere between 30 and 40 people. And as you see in my little chart here, about nine of those were planetarium staff members. Um, tomorrow, we will be a team of three. And I say we because I am one of the three members who was actually kept, which I'm incredibly grateful for. Although if any of you are in a similar position as me and you've seen staff colleagues, equals, or direct reports head home, there's a certain amount of workplace survivor guilt, I think is the best way I could describe it, which is just, you know, you don't really want to keep working without your support, without your safety net, without your, your friends. Um, but but we're, we're charging forward. I've had the, I've had a week or so to process through different stages of kind of how to deal with this and how to go forward. And so ultimately, what we need to do now, all three members of the Mystic Seaport Museum Education Department, is we need to become a distance learning platform, uh, find ways to keep our visitors, our museum members, our local students and teachers, uh, to keep them engaged in all of our subjects. Obviously, my little corner of the world is astronomy, but some of you may know my background is I'm actually a history teacher by trade. So I think part of the reason why I was held, kept was because of my versatility and my ability to say, all right, this morning I'm going to talk about astronomy and this afternoon I'm going to talk about whaling. Um, and so uh, we have been asked to seek opportunities for sources of revenue, but really the goal now is just to provide enough free content that we can stay in everyone's good graces because someday we are going to reopen. And the goal is to have everybody remember, oh, remember all the great things that Mystic Seaport Museum did while we were all sitting around our house? So, so our directive from the higher ups is not so much find a way to make money, but more just get your content out there, get in front of people and make it so that people will continue to like us. Um, so back to my experiment of eight days ago, I, I deliberately did not set up a virtual background today because I kind of wanted to give you guys just a little glimpse into the, um, into the background uh, of the world here. And so one of the advantages of having an entire museum's worth of resources is I was given our museum's green screen. It's a, a rather crudely put together studio I've got here in my home office now with lighting and cameras and green screens. But you know, I at the very least have uh, those resources at my disposal. Uh, so many of you are working with Zoom a lot more. I'm, I'm hoping I'm gonna be able to catch at least part of the advanced Zoom presentation today because uh, what I'll delve into a little bit right now about my program, it's probably going to seem pretty basic. I mean, talk about learning on the fly. I didn't even know what Zoom was two weeks ago, and now I spend six to eight hours a day on it. <laughs> so it's become uh, my home away from home. 
But um, on this experiment, this one week's time to throw together how to teach moon phases virtually, um, certainly there was quite a bit of screen sharing going on. And you, you can see from this little screenshot just a, a part of the room full of the hundred people we had um, checking in and watching this program. And uh, it was... It was interesting. I, I think it went well for the first try. I've actually done a second one yesterday morning. It was only for 50 people. Uh, so the second try was a little bit uh, a little bit better off. But what we tried to do was to keep it interactive. And so even though a large part of it was a slideshow, I kept trying to integrate these little segments that I would call uh, the try it moments. The moments where you could, rather than just sit there and watch me talk on a screen, grab something from around your house and, uh, and give it a try. Many of you, I'm I'm sure familiar with the typical moon phases experiment where you have a, an unshaded lamp and a, a styrofoam ball that you hold in front of your head and that's the moon and you're the earth and so you know you can put that together with a, a flashlight and a, a ball of various sizes and everybody has that lying around their house so rather than um, needing for students to be in a classroom where you've already gathered the supplies if you think about it you can kind of turn some of your traditional activities into a uh, all right what do we have have just kind of lying around the house. Um, so I have three big takeaways that I've learned from my seven days on the job here, and it's not to be preachy in any way, but if you're, if you're thinking about trying this or if you're nervous about trying this, uh, the three little nuggets that I've kind of extracted from my time so far. Number one, and I cannot stress this enough, it's so much better than it seems on your end. And I gave you guys, again, just a little bit of a, this is my, my wife taking the picture of me from the side view. And of course, it's looking very professional on the screen, and yet I cannot get over the fact that I'm sitting at the bench that's normally on my dining room table with you know random things just out of the shot that I can reach and grab as needed and it it feels very clunky because uh, I know what room I'm in I know I have my my little pegboard with my my little beagle calendar over there on the wall but nobody else can see that they, they don't know what you have obviously in your homes I'm looking in the room here at all these virtual backgrounds some of you I can see your offices your living rooms but some of you are doing a really nice job of masking your surroundings so as awkward as it feels, when you start to see the comments in the chat room, like, whoa, this is so cool, neat, awesome, um, you know, you really realize that it, it doesn't, much like, you know, the first time you're in your planetarium dome and you're going through a new show going, okay, that didn't sound quite like I wanted it to, it's always better on the audience's end. I'm sure that's something we can all relate to. Um, just in case you're wondering, you, you see me there holding my, my blow up earth and my model moon. Uh, some of the other triad activities we had, we did a, a fraction problem, you know, to figure out that the moon is approximately one fourth the diameter of earth. And so I had fractions set up for the kids. We were trying to do some math. Um, I did a little animation time lapse of tides rising and falling, and we talked about the effects that the moon has on their lives. Um, I tried activity because one of the big things they're stressing nowadays, even in the schools, is as part of their lessons to try to get the kids to go outside. And so this idea of, you want to try it? Can you get to a place that's near water? Watch the water rise and fall, your local river, your local, you know, shore, coastline. I realize I'm very fortunate that I happen to live along the coastline. Not everyone has that, but um, so that was my first lesson learned. The second lesson learned, which I'm sure we've all learned from our interactions with Zoom so far, is that the interaction will never be the same as if you were standing there in the classroom. And so there are different sort of ways that you can interact with people, even though I only, can only see four people on my screen right now. It's me, Mike McConville, Mike Murray, and Dana Thompson. I don't know how you guys floated to the top. Maybe you were the first ones in the room. Um, but there are uh, participants. How many we got in here right now? There are 67 people in the room right now. Uh, so how do I interact with everybody? Um, you know, you could say things like, raise your hand if you guys all know what this is like, and you can tally that. Or the big one I've been getting a lot is, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down. Is this something we like? Is this something we don't like? You can get kind of quick polls. Um, when it came to the fractions, you know, how, how, much, how much bigger is the moon, Earth's diameter than the moon? You know, that's a single digit number. You can answer that on your fingers and, and certainly giving answers in the chat box. I, I have not been mon monitoring the uh, chat box. I know there's been some things coming in as I've been uh, been presenting here. I'm going to have to peek at that in just a second. 
Um, but the chat box brings me to my third lesson, which I kind of learned the hard way last week. Um, my first ever program, we had an entire class where the teacher told her 30 kids, I want you to log in and watch this program. Oh my God. So uh, you guys are seeing just a little bit of the chat box, all the good stuff. What you're not seeing are the Fortnite invitations and the complaints about how hungry they are and how bored they are. And, and it's, it's amazing what 30 uh, middle school kids will do when you give them the freedom to say whatever they want. So um, one of the things we learned very, very quickly, and this is hard to do when you're working with a reduced staff, but it helps to have a moderator. Uh, certainly Mike's been doing a great job of moderating these e-conferences but you'll notice in this screenshot, there's me and there's the Mystic Seaport Museum. And that is my colleague who is going to funnel through all of the wreckage to find the gold nuggets, the, the great questions and the great answers. And so I don't have to deal with any of that stuff. I just wait for her to unmute her video. And in my periphery, when I see that Mystic Seaport Museum logo turn into my colleague, Crystal, I will know, all right, she's got something good for me. Uh, and so it, it works both ways. This morning, she did a primary source workshop where I was the moderator. And I hung out off the camera and scoured through the chat room. And I was like, wait, I've got something good. Let me chime in here. Uh, so if you have that capability, if you have that support staff, it really helps to allow the presenter to focus on the instruction and having a moderator to not only filter good questions, but filter good answers has proven to be extremely valuable. Um, so, um, uh, to give you guys an idea of kind of what we're working on in the pipeline, and I've seen these on, uh, on Dome Dialogues and on other places on Facebook. These are by no means original ideas, um, but some of the things that we're going to be trying later this week, uh, our own version of the use Stellarium to do a planetarium show, we're going to give that a, a whirl on Thursday afternoon. Um, on Friday morning, we're going to try out a kid's version of what we co typically call our Zoo in the Sky program. That's usually a live planetarium show where we point out animals constellations and the kids make animal noises and you know what sound does a lion make roar and what sound does a bear make same roar and what sound does Draco the dragon make and somehow the same roar um, I don't know what it is about those animals that just they all make the same roar um, but what we're gonna do to turn this visual a uh, virtual I should say is we're gonna turn it into kind of zoo in the sky story time and uh, we've been talking a lot about story time and I'm sure if any of you have have uh, explored this there's of course the the issue of uh, royalty rights and you know do you have permission to read someone else's book on camera obviously t many of the programs we're doing now are free programs um, I also understand that there's a lot of relaxing going on of these royalty rights somebody told me the other day that apparently JK Rowling gave teachers permission to read Harry Potter in the classroom because you know you gotta do what you gotta do so so there are opportunities out there to you know we're all stuck trying to create our own content but if we don't have to reinvent the wheel if we could bring a story in to fill a little time and and even for your your local school kids who are used to seeing you in the planetarium if they see you your face on screen reading them a story it can be equally powerful as opposed to them maybe just reading from home um, and then we're trying to, it's, it's, it's way, way deep in the pipeline. If anybody has any ideas about this offline, I'd love to talk about it, but I've been trying to figure out how we can do our scaling solar system program in virtual format. And I, I've heard, you know, there's different ways to use different size sports balls to represent the planets. And obviously everybody's in really tight, confined spaces. So how do you fit the entire solar system into your, your living room or your home office? But it's, it's kind of the, the next one on the horizon that we're, uh, we're looking to kind of build towards. Um, so if anybody is interested in collaborating, um, I would love to chat with you guys. Um, we have a, we had a pretty strict, um, uh, gosh, what's it called? Intellectual property policy, you know, the Mystic Seaport. Anything Mystic Seaport Museum creates is the property of Mystic Seaport Museum. And again, things are getting relaxed in these uh, very, very unusual times. So I'm not pretending like any of this belongs to me. If anybody would like to see my virtual moon 
phases program and kind of uh, the layout of how I put things together, or if anybody has any ideas, if anybody's got some free time and would like to help me make a new program, I will give you co-writer credit. Um, I think collaboration can be really, really powerful at a time like this. Uh, so I'd be really interested in, uh, in hanging out with folks and, uh, and learning from all of my, uh, my awesome planetarium friends. Um, so I'm going to stop my share here. I have so much to get caught up in the chat room, but um, bunnies roar. Yeah, it's true, right? Um, <laughs> so I think that's pretty much all I've got. Um, I, uh, I've got a few more minutes before I have to hop out. So I'm going to sort of pitch it back to Mike. I don't know if there's hand raises or questions in the chat room, but I'll have to, uh, I'll have to take a look and see. Yeah, so let's open it up to any questions you guys might have. There's a lot of, you know, bear goes roar. We have a question from Catherine. Kat, go on ahead. Can you post like a list of the supplies that you use to kind of set up your corner? Because I'm not very strong with video creation like this. So that would be super helpful for me. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I'll put together like a, a materials list and, and it'll make its way over to the Dome Dialogues. Absolutely, I'd be happy to do that. Mark Percy, go on ahead. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask more detail about when you're working with a moderator. Um, so you've got that moderator's video pinned. That way they're, they're always on the side, correct? Yes, so that, that in that aspect, we're kind of working with the, the moderator is the co-host. So Zoom has this feature where, um, I don't know, Mike, if anybody else besides you is a co-host of this particular um, uh, e-conference, but there are ways to have the hosts and the co-hosts kind of pinned to the top. So my field of view will always be me, my co-host, and the, the, the first three kids that I can see on the screen. But there right. is a way to make it so your moderator is pinned to the top. Okay, that was the, the, the question I put out in the chat. So if anybody's got more specifics mm -hmm. about that, but then, so the moderator's reading the chat and then when they have something interesting, they unmute their video and then do they like verbally read the, the question or something? I mean, how does that actually work? Yeah, so uh, the, way we, the way we've been kind of tackling it so far is, yeah, they would start with their video muted and just like sort of the logo on there. And then in my periphery, I, I've kind of got my, my rig here with a, a separate camera, but I kind of rig it so that just kind of right behind the camera, I have my computer screen. So when I see her come offline, that's kind of my trigger that like, all right, she's either got a really good question or a really good answer for me. And then I would allow her to say, all right, looks like I'm getting a really good question from the chat room. So Crystal, what do you got? and then she hops on and, and pitches it to me but for the most part stays kind of hidden and out of the way during the the instruction points I kind of try to build in moments throughout the program where it's like all right now's probably a good time usually around the time we're doing a try it hands-on activity um, that'll be a good kind of pause point to say anybody have any questions about this section before we move on to something new okay understood Thank you. All right, sure. Brian, we have a, a question from Susan. Do you record your presentations? We do, yes, we have been. So um, th there was a little bit of a debate in our institution, which was, should we record these and make them available at a later date? And th it's as great as that sounds, the, the point that was raised, which was, if you only ever record and put your programs out for free, how are you ever gonna get people to pay for them? So the fact that we've gotten this, um, this revenue is not priority number one mandate kind of helps. Uh, what we've experimented with, and we're gonna try this model out for some of our adult programs is we are going to make the live programs available to our museum members to give them the opportunity for that interaction and that you're seeing this first and then we can put it out there for the world to see and that way we're trying to figure out what kind of value adds we can give to the members in our museum certainly I'm sure everybody's museum has members and they're all probably sitting around wondering all right what am I getting for my my membership right now so this idea that you can make the initial live program available to them and then by recording it at, at a date you decide you could say a week later we'll release it and that way it feels like the people who got to experience it firsthand are really getting a perk. Mike Murray you're up. Thank you. 
thanks, Brian. It was really great to see some of the things that you're developing. And I think these are great experiences. A lot of us are, are uh, also working really hard to stay connected with our communities through a lot of things like this. Uh, I just wanted to add real quickly a little uh, uh, effort that's going on in IPS. I'm the, I'm the chair of the membership I, uh, committee for IPS. And one of the things that we're working on, I've worked with Mark and others, is to gather some of the best resources that we're finding both within and even outside the planetarium community because so many places, anywhere from uh, Nat Geo to uh, NSF to NASA are creating a lot of uh, online resources, videos, activities. And we're especially looking for things like, um, uh, you know, activity based things that, you know, parents can do with their kids, things like that. But uh, we're trying to gather a, a good collection of these things. And the way that we want to try to distribute it is through a new network that we're experimenting with. Uh, I don't know if you all have heard of the Mighty Networks. Uh, it's a, a great new tool that goes beyond, say, just a, uh, just a chat room or just a, a, a listserv like Domel has been. It allows you to post lots of resources, special subject areas, instructional videos, anything that you want. So we're uh, trying to spin this thing up and get it started. And this is one of the places we want to be able to list a lot of the resources. And if you all are finding things that you think would be great to share, uh, please feel free to send them to me. I'll make sure that you, I'll put my email address up there and we're going to start posting them on the, the Mighty Networks and make sure that everybody's invited. Maybe I'll do a presentation in the future to show you what this network is, how to get into it, how to use it. So we're trying to spin this thing up, especially within the membership committee. So I just wanted to quickly let you all know about that. Thank you. All right, so Brian, not necessarily a question, but let's see how you might react to it. Uh, Steve Fentress uh, posted that their social media person uh, just asked if we should share a post from an astrophysicist uh, about whether Saturn is transiting the sun today. So how would you be, how would you approach that if you were approached by someone asking? Are you asking me? Oh, no, no we're asking Bri how Brian would want us. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well much better. We'll yeah. put him on the spot. No, oh, yeah, wow, you really did put me on the spot. Uh, and I'm sorry, I, I, I'll, I'll chime in my two cents, and I'm sorry to say I'm going to have to duck out in just a few minutes. But um, but that is an interesting an interesting question. Um, I, uh, social media person just asked me to share a post from astrophysicist about Saturn transiting the sun today. Um, so I just, first off, thumbs up, thumbs down. Is Saturn transiting the sun today? I wasn't even aware. Um, Saturn transiting the sun. Yeah, okay. Um <laughs> From from whose perspective is trans Saturn transiting the sun? Is that from uh, um, that is that is tricky? I think you know I. The good news is my personal social media coordinator kind of comes to me without, and to bring up like, you know, hearing all this stuff about a blood moon and the super moon, it's gonna be like seven times larger than it normally is. Is there anything to that? Um, so I, I bravo to you that your social media coordinator reaches out to you and doesn't just throw something on there. Um, I'll share with you guys a funny story that uh, of what happens when you let your social media coordinator go rogue. Back in the summer on July 20th, we were planning an Apollo 50th anniversary event. And that morning, as I'm getting all my stuff set up, I got a text message from a colleague that says, you need to call our social media coordinator because of what he just did on Facebook. And I was like, why? What happened? I go on our Facebook page and it says, come to our planetarium today as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of when John Glenn walked on the moon. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so it's a Saturday. I call the guy, I put home and I'm like, damn, you need to take that down right now. And of course, damage is done. You've got like eight people who comment on it. Like, what a joke. Oh my God, LOL, are you serious? And you know, you can take that down, but what's done is done. So um, yeah, I think... I think if you are if you're all in the position where you have a little bit of uh, of sway with your social media coordinator, it's really nice when they check in with you uh, before they put something like that up. So, um, <laughs> yeah, definitely something I can uh, I can certainly uh, relate to because I've been there. <laughs> all right. So, any other questions for for Brian this uh, this afternoon? Since we're like right on time, which is great. <laughs> Does, Patty, do you have a question or is Patty just waving? 
She's just waving. Okay. Oh. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Brian, for uh, your presentation yeah. today. Much appreciated. Thank you, guys. I look forward to seeing everybody else's presentations in the recorded version, and I will uh, hopefully catch up with you all soon. All right, so that brings us, uh, we're, we're, we're on schedule. It's like three conferences in and we're still on schedule. It's crazy. Um, uh, we'll turn it over a uh, little bit about Mars 2020, uh, the, the new Perseverance rover. Uh, we'll turn it over to, I guess, resident Mars expert, Ken Brandt. Ken Brandt, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening or good night or whatever phase you're in. Um, you know, that question about Mars, or sorry, Saturn transiting the sun had me going for a second. I was like, wait, wait, how, where do we look that up? And then I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> so well done, Michael, you got me. But you know, speaking of which, I wanna share my screen here and show you a quick clip from the Huygens mission um, as it was getting ready to uh, enter into Titan's atmosphere. Um, Huygens took this image Pretty cool. So the Earth was actually transiting the sun on the day Huygens was landing on, on Titan. Just happened to like once in a thousand year event because as you can see, it's cutting right through the center of the sun here, basically. Okay, twice, fine. Um, anyway, but to get onto Mars, are you seeing my PowerPoint screen? No? Okay. Let me stop sharing and share again and see if I can pull it up. There it is. Okay. How about now? Are you seeing it now, Michael? Okay, good. All right. So we're going to start the slideshow from the start. So here is Death by PowerPoint, uh, the Mars 2020 Perseverance uh, version. Now, um, I borrowed these slides with the permission of Drs. Williford and Chen two of the scientists working on, and engineers working on the uh, Perseverance mission. And I get this information from a program I'm involved in called the Solar System Ambassadors. And the Solar System Ambassadors is a nationwide group of volunteers that help JPL. Um, quick shout out, how many ambassadors are in the audience with me today? Let me pull up the chat window. I can't see the chat window from the screen. Oh, wait, there it is. Whoops. And that's where we're going today. <laughs> we're going to Mars. There we go. I pulled up the chat window. There. Okay. So that's where we're headed. And that's what it looks like through a pretty decent amateur telescope at opposition. So that's what I saw back in 2003, looking through my Celestron 8-inch uh, uh, reflector. reflector. Now this is the overall mission architecture that NASA's designed and other nations have designed for the Mars exploration now and in the future. And you'll notice the, the mantra for the Opportunity Rover and Spirit and even uh, to a certain extent Curiosity was to follow the water, go where the water was. And um, that in some senses, the Mars 2020 is no different. I'm still calling it 2020 when its real name is now Perseverance. So bear with me if I interchange those two names, we're talking about the same machine. Um, so you can see the architecture here exploring habit habitability and Mars 2020 is actually gonna go out there and look for signs of life. So there's the 2020 rover to um, like on a projected Mars landscape there what they think the terrain might look like when it lands at Jezero Crater next February. So the first step, of course, is to get it off the ground. And Atlas V, um, pushing it up off the ground there, um, launch rig it happening anytime after July 21 to, I think, August 9th is the launch window. Then, of course, the seven-month cruise. Then we go to entry, descent, and landing. And this looks very familiar. It's the exact, almost the exact same landing architecture and engineering that was employed by the Curiosity rover. And to quote um, Ms. Uh, Dr. Chen, um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> so this worked once, it worked really well. They're gonna use the same general architecture again. 
Now, where things get different is when we start talking about the surface mission. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. So the 2020 mission objectives, first off, characterize the geology, look for lots more evidence of flowing and standing water. Um, it's landing in a delta valley in, a, in the bed of an old lake or La Crut, what they call the custering environment. Um, and looking for, whoops, sorry. I thought they were gonna go through the series like we did the last time. Um, if you look at for the astrobiology, we're actually looking for evidence of fossils here. And there's gonna be a lot more extensive um, emphasis on collecting samples that are gonna one day come back to earth to be analyzed by earth labs. So there'll be geo sampling going on. So about 40 samples, including some blanks to um, calibrate the machinery and all that. Um, they're gonna collect 20 during the prime mission, which is one Martian uh, year or about almost two earth years, um, including the geologic diversity. And they're also going to prepare for humans. And the key thing here is um, a little machine on the body of the rover that's actually gonna convert carbon dioxide in the Martian atmosphere to oxygen. So they're gonna test out the feasibility of using that machine. So when people get to Mars, they can uh, build their own oxygen out of the air on Mars. What's called in situ resource um, yeah, utilization. Now this is an example of a stromatolite, which is an, a colonial blue-green algae that forms these pillars or these lumps in the, in the rock. Um, and they're very easy to detect. And that's one of the things that uh, this rover might be looking for. So you can read what's there. So the pixel um, spectrometer will look for the elements present in the sample. Sherlock, which is another spectrometer, looks for the chemical compounds or the mineral compounds and can look for things like organics. You know. And the sample collection array with the course, the coring drill, because you want to get up underneath. Mars is covered with rust. We all know that. So you have to have some means to get up underneath the rust. Now you can drill it, you can brush it off, you can shoot it full of holes with a laser. Uh, so this rover has the ability to do all three. So some, it's got some way of getting up underneath the crust to find out what the actual rocks and minerals and possible biosignatures are inside or underneath that rust crust. Now this is a typical sampling tube. Um, gives a sample about five centimeters long, one centimeter in diameter. So roughly uh, the size of part of your pinky finger would be um, the sampling size for this. And it's gonna get 20 in the prime mission and up to uh, I think 37 um, total samples. That's gonna cache somewhere for a future sample return mission to go to Mars, pick them up, bring them back to Earth. So this is a global map of Mars. Of course, um, I always like to tell my students what the colors mean. And in this case, the colors, of course, are, uh, represent relative altitudes, okay? The blues and greens would be below mean sea level if you were to have a sea level on Mars. And the yellows, reds, oranges, and whites and browns indicate high altitudes with the whites being extremely highest. So we're gonna go down to Jezero Crater and Northeast Sirtis Crater, which are two craters that are neighbor, neighbors to one another. And so there's, um, there's, uh, whoops, let me pull my cursor where the arrow is there. That's Jezero Crater right there. That's the landing site for the rover, the 2020 rover. And this is the close up of the landing site and this is a geological map showing the different um, species by colors. Uh, the blues and the purples are clay minerals and the greens are carbonate minerals. And the yellow, I'm not sure what that is. Um, but anyway, so the entry descent landing system, we're gonna shift over to that. Um, you can find much more about the landing, um, where this thing is landing and what, it's, what they're trying to discover when they land there but we're gonna concentrate on how they're gonna actually get down to Mars here. 
And of course the sky crane is the same sky crane that um, basic design that they use for the Curiosity rover. Now you can see by the relative size of these landing ellipses that landing on Mars has gotten more specific over the years. Uh, the Pathfinder back in 96 or 97 um, had a very broad landing ellipse. And it was a much smaller vehicle than any of the other vehicles that we're talking about in the, in the succeeding ellipses. Phoenix and Insight had a rough, rather um, long and uh, rather, um, what do you call it, um, eccentric ellipse for a landing site. Now the Science Laboratory in 2012 had a pretty uh, low, um, damn it, that term again for the extent of an ellipse. And you can see that the, uh, the, the 2020 rover has got a very small landing ellipse relative to the other ones, which is very good. Now, one thing that the um, 2020 rover can do that Curiosity and everything else could not is called terrain relative navigation. That means it compares the images it gets from the descent cameras at the base of the lander um, to the images that have been shot by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter's high-rise uh, camera. And there are several hundred of those images of Jezero Crater and the regions around it. So the rover has a lot to compare as it's coming down with this onboard computer. There's your landing ellipse. Um, they're probably, they want to land somewhere here in towards the center of the ellipse, but off the ridges of, of the, the delta here, you can see the delta here, they want to land somewhere right out here so they can drive up into the delta once they've landed. And the terrain is very reminiscent of one of the walls of Death Valley in California. And this is a helicopter using that terrain navigation radar to autonomously land. So the pilot has her hands off the controls at this point. And there's the landing radar right there in the front of the helicopter. So that's the landing radar as viewed from underneath the helicopter. And it's trying to land out in this delta here in this fan um, at the base of these hills. So it doesn't want to land in the hills, it wants to land at the base of the hills. And that's sort of what the, Curie, what the uh, 2020 rover is going to be doing. Okay. So it takes a series of images of the terrain, compares them to aerial maps of the terrain, and then guides itself accordingly. Now, the, um, there are pressure sensors in the heat in the back shell, and which is the white part here, and the heat shield of the rover as it comes down. And a multitude of descent and imaging cameras are here. Um, the cameras also have microphones. So what you're going to have for your audiences, once this gets down safely and all this data is uploaded to Earth, you're going to have a rover's eye view or of the, cam of the parachute inflating in Mars's atmosphere, which you've never seen before. You're also going to get a rover's eye view from the descent imager of the rover descending on the sky crane. You're going to get the rover looking up at the sky crane, at the... Um, descent rockets, and then the rover, of course, looking down at the ground. And this is a short animation of the entry, descent, and landing, the seven minutes of terror video you've seen before, but this um, isn't quite as dramatic. So we're going to fast forward a little bit to where it's deployed its parachute. Now let's go back here for a minute. Usually around here in your other um, entry, descent, and landing videos, there's animation of flames coming off the heat shield, which would certainly be happening in this image, but they haven't 
uh, used it this time for reasons I don't understand. But it's at this point, back when I first started working in the planetarium back in 2004, when one of my audience members raised her hand and asked me why Mars was so hot. And it's an important um, misconception that gets conveyed by this heat shield with the burning red of Mars in the background there. It looks hot but it's really obviously quite cold because it's further from the sun, among other reasons. And, um, but it's important your audiences know that because a lot of them walk out with that misconception that Mars is hot based on watching the EDL videos that you've all seen. So your landing site is highlighted in gray. There's Jezero Crater. There's the delta right there. And the rover's heat shield has done a really good job of slowing it down, coming into the atmosphere, of course. And we'll zip along a little further. All these little lines you're seeing are radar sighting, uh, sites that the radar has taken of the ground. So it's starting to figure out where it wants to land. And of course, it keeps doing that. And now all of these highlighted areas are places that are safe to land. So the greens and blues are good, the reds and oranges not so good. So it's uh, seeking out a safe place to land in amongst those red and orange splotches in the terrain. Now Curiosity could never have made this landing this way. You can see the delta's edge right here. So it wants to land right in this nice little blue field here. Just close enough to the delta where it can basically drive through it within a couple of days. So the nice part about this mission is they're going to be able to do the science pretty much right away. As soon as they touch down and deploy the mass and everything. So there it is coming down. There's the delta to the right there. It actually looks like a small set of hills because that's what it is. Um, when you actually get down to ground eye level, this is a couple hundred feet high here. So there goes our parachute and heat shield, or back shell, excuse me. And coming down for a nice soft landing. The descent stage flies away, never to be heard from again. <laughs> and our lander has landed safe and sound on Mars. Now, once, while that's happening and once it's landed, um, MAVEN and MRO are both flying overhead. So all of the data can be uplinked to those two satellites to transfer back to Earth as soon as they get in range of the, um, the deep sky network that JPL runs. Okay, so this is mo probably the most important slide of the entire presentation for us as planetarians. Um, the landing day is set, Thursday, February 18th of 2021. That's an important date. And this is supposed to be landing between noon and 1 p.m. Pacific time. So for my time zone, 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern. So prime time for many of us to do landing events in the United States anyway. Um, those of you in other time zones may have a little more of a challenge. But you'll recall Curiosity landed very late in the evening um, Eastern Standard Time, or Eastern Daylight Time, back in August of 2012. So this is a prime time for running events uh, coinciding with the landing, which I'm sure NASA is going to do many of. So at this point, I'm going to pull the chat window up back in the middle here and ask if there are any questions about perseverance that I can answer. Oh, there's eight new messages down there. Well, okay. <laughs> Let me get to it. Oh, come on. Well, Ken, I can actually take care of that. Um, okay. We'll kind of go down the list. Uh, Mike Murray asks, can we have permission to use the PowerPoint and animations? I believe so. I got permission from Drs. Williford and Chen because I'm a solar system ambassador. So I have to ask that question. Okay, so I'll ask that question. 
of them. Right, a uh, question from Eric Briggs. Uh, is the animation, any of these animations going to be part of NASA's eyes on the solar system? I don't know that answer. I'm not familiar, I'm not too familiar with eyes on the solar system, okay. but I'm pretty sure that all of the animations and videos are on the um, Perseverance website, which if you type in Mars JPL Perseverance, um, I'm sure you're gonna get, you know, their at least to their multimedia. And that's where a lot of these videos are coming from. So you can put together your own presentation with the multimedia there as well. Uh, and then uh, Toshi asks, um, what was the time of the landing again? The time of the landing, February 18th, uh, it's about, somewhere between 12 and 1 PDT, or Pacific Standard Time, excuse me, because we're still in Standard Time at that time of the year. <laughs> or most of us are, <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, Bueller Planetarium asks if you'll be talking about this during uh, Port of Call Mars next week. Oh, I don't know. I haven't been invited. <laughs> Oh, that's all. Oh, oh, yes. That's no, that's um, that's Derek. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, we're Derek and I are planning on doing a convers uh, conversation about Mars and a show about Mars. So, yeah, I'm sure elements of this will certainly be part of that. Cool. All right. Any other questions for Ken, Perseverance, Mars 2020? Or the solar system ambassadors, you know. All right. Okay. Looks like we've got uh, no more questions. Of course, if you do have more, we can post things in the the e conference uh, event page. Uh, but thanks, Ken, for the presentation this afternoon. Really appreciate it. Ken Brand, everybody. All right. Uh, so that puts us a little bit ahead of schedule. Uh, but the the next two presenters we have are actually in the room. Um, let's see. Uh, let me just confirm real quick. Uh, can I get a, I will actually stop your, uh, your sharing there. Uh, can I get confirmation from Mike Smale that he is in the room? I am in the room. There we go. All right. So uh, uh, one of the ideas that got kicked around this week for this e-conference and for some of the future ones uh, is that we spent a lot of time talking about astronomy, a lot of times trying to be kind of super serious and professional. Uh, and we'll continue to be serious and largely professional. Uh, but, we, you know, we wanted to do some things that were a little different, maybe kind of uh, a little bit more reverent, kind of cut the tension of what it is to be in quarantine uh, in the modern day. And so uh, we're introducing a new segment, the first of these new, two new segments. Um, this is The Record Shop with Mike Smale. Uh, and so Mike's actually got a, he's a man who needs no introduction. So I get an introduction, that's great, yeah. Uh, <laughs> hi everybody, uh, my name is Mike Smale, I'm with the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. And uh, yeah, I'm just gonna uh, talk for a couple minutes about uh, a couple of records. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of free form, uh, I've kind of <clears throat> some ideas in mind and uh, uh, basically talk about a record. I will uh, then share some links in the comments uh, where you can get more information, where you can listen to it, things like that. Uh, and then at the end, I'll put up a, a big slide that has information about all three, uh, all three records. So, um, <clears throat> looking behind me, you can see a, a, a selection of uh, my record collection. I have a, a lot of records, I think you could say. And uh, the first one that I wanted to show you is one that is uh, is definitely, I think, topically relevant uh, to all of us. Uh, this came out uh, uh, early, early. It's been out for about a year. It came out early last year, and I was at uh, Reckless, which is one of our local record stores here in Chicago. And I'd come up to the counter with my stack of records to buy, and I looked up on the wall behind the behind the register, and they had this record up there. And I said, "Holy cow! What is that? Can you get that down? Let me let me see that." So, uh, so they pull it down, and um, this is uh, uh, what I think you would definitely call an impulse purchase. It's a record called Planisphere. And uh, what's interesting about this record is uh, not only is it full of music, but when you take it out, so the record is uh, it's what's called a picture disc. So these are basically pressed with a large image uh, underneath a real thin layer of clear plastic. Uh, Audio-wise, they're generally a little uh, a little lower quality than most uh, most records. But uh, as you've no doubt noticed, there are star charts on either side of this. You've got the northern hemisphere on the A side, the southern hemisphere on the B side, 
And then the PVC jacket that it comes in allows it to function as a planisphere. So we go ahead and uh, we line it up, you can line up your, your month and your date. Uh, and you see this now functions as a star chart uh, for the night sky. And then on the back side, you've got some, uh, some handy information for when folks are out looking up the night sky, use a red light, follow the brightest stars, take some time to orient yourself. Uh, if somebody wants to get Rob Walrecht on making these, I'm sure he'd be, uh, I'm sure he'd be game. Now the, uh, the record itself is put together, it's a, it's a compilation record by a label here in Chicago called Numero. And they tend to do pretty, um, some pretty eccentric, they do a lot of old reissues. And this is a collection of potentially 80s, early 90s, kind of weird spacey music. I'm, I'm definitely not crazy about the music on this, uh, but it's, uh, it's phenomenally functional as you can you know, take it out with you and use it to find your way around the night sky. So moving on from a record that- uh, Mike, we got a quick question about the Planisphere LP. Um, yeah. What latitude is it for? Uh, it is uh, it is set for uh, 30 degrees to 40 degrees north latitude. Okay. And uh, let me dump the info in the chat real quick about this. Uh, the first link is a, uh, a link to where you can buy it. The second link is a really delightful, like purposefully 90s GeoCities-esque website. Um, made to promote it, featuring some uh, some spoof clips with a guy named Carl Jansky telling you all about the night sky uh, in a very, very south side uh, Chicago fashion. Uh, so cabinet of Cassiopeia.org, definitely check that out when you have some free time. All right, next up, <clears throat> uh, another thing that I'm, I'm really big on is music that we can actually use in the dome. Uh, music that goes well, maybe under your narration when you're talking about a sky show. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Michael, for answering uh, Mark's question. And one of, um, one of my favorite artists in the kind of ambient instrumental uh, genre is a guy named Matthew Cooper. Uh, he releases music under the stage name of Illuvium. And probably my, uh, my he, it's, kind of, it's kind of wide ranging. Uh, it's, some of the music is a little more electronic. Some of it's very piano heavy. Uh, some has quite a, bit of, uh, quite a bit of guitar in it. And probably my, my favorite Illuvium record is one of his earlier records is called Copia. Uh, it came out in 2007, which was this before the kind of vinyl resurgence bubble. So when it was originally released, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't available on vinyl. And the only way to get it was through uh, these large box sets uh, called Life Through Bombardment, which were put out by Temporary Residence, which is their label. Uh, these are some monstrous uh, seven LP uh, books. And this will be the tricky part of the presentation here. Uh, on the inside of them, this is the, uh, the second Life of Bombardment volume. There's some nice uh, astronomical-esque artwork. And the really cool thing that I think we all went to the library as kids, we can all relate to this. There's a little library card holder. And then inside of it, they made a little library card with the, the artist, the people that worked on the record, and then the person who bought it, which uh, you can see that's me there at the bottom. So the original... Uh, Volume one of Life Through Bombardment was what Copia was on. It's been sold out for a long time. Uh, fortunately, a few years back, they actually re they reissued Copia and you can, you can uh, purchase it uh, on vinyl or of course, downloading streaming if that's, uh, if that's your jam. And a, uh, a really cool, another little uh, connection thing uh, to this band, to this record. So uh, his newest record that came out a few months ago is called Piano Works. I mean, it's his first all piano record. Um, that he's released in, in quite some time. And the sort of deluxe version of it also came with a, uh, an additional record. Um, I didn't get it out because the color doesn't show through all that well. Uh, actually, maybe, we'll still give it a try. There's a, um, I don't know which pressing plant this is, but over the last year or two, there's, there's been a, a plant that's been pressing these kind of pearlescent colored records. Uh, it doesn't come through well. It just kind of looks like white, but this is a very, uh, a very iridescent blue purple um, sort of, uh, you can see a little bit of the, the variations in there. Think, uh, think storms in Jupiter's atmosphere, um, but uh, a real, a real, a real pretty record. And um, what he did, so I don't know if any of you ever took piano lessons when you were a kid. I know I did. And you had the, there were those little piano books for learning how to play the songs. Uh, with the release of the new record, he made uh, a little booklet 
with uh, the sheet music for uh, for the record that he just released, as well as for a number of his uh, earlier uh, earlier songs, including several of the ones uh, from uh, from Copia. So that's that's Matthew Cooper. Uh, that's Alluvium, which again, if you get your uh, get your licensing all squared away, is uh, pretty works really really well uh, underneath narration. Uh, if you need something to go along with your uh, Star Talks. Oh, Steve Crawford looks almost like a laser disc. Tell you what, if you want to see a laser disc, um, I had planned to give this to Dan Tell as a gift, and I'm just going to say this here in confidence because I know he's not here. This is a uh, a Worf uh, laser disc uh, compilation. Um, it's basically uh, four Worf episodes of TNG, and. Uh, And yeah, there you go, actual laser disc. All right, uh, got a couple more minutes. Um, one, uh, one last record I wanna talk about, getting away from kind of planetary music altogether. Um, <clears throat> this is basically the, the last new record that I bought about two weeks ago before the world kind of shut down. Um, <clears throat> it is a band called The Bomb Pops. It's a pop punk band from Southern California. This is their new record, Death in Venice Beach, uh, name inspired by the Thomas Mann uh, story of the same title about uh, artistry and obsession and all the things that come along with it. Um, and I was pretty angry because they, they put up this new record and then they embarked on a tour and I don't even think they got their first tour date out. They were supposed to play here in Chicago back on the uh, 21st. Um, and that got canceled, but uh, I was still able to go out and uh, get the new record. Uh, very upbeat, hooky, uh, pop punk, um, but a lot of kind of interesting dark themes. Uh, there's one song on this inspired by the, uh, the fire at the Notre Dame Cathedral, uh, one studied by, or one, one song about the, uh, one of the co-vocalists uh, study, or difficulties living with type one diabetes and the, the challenges that presents when you're in a band and you're touring on the road and things of that nature. Uh, so new Bomb Pops record, uh, really good. Uh, also, their uh, their seven inch that came out before this is called Dear Beer. Uh, it's a little uh, a little four song EP. Uh, one of the songs is called Polluted Skies, which is uh, mostly about light or mostly about atmospheric pollution living in Los Angeles. Uh, but there's a couple of neat little hooks in the lyrics that uh, kind of lead it, uh, lend it toward um, toward light pollution as well, and referencing the moon and the city lights and things like that, which is kind of cool. So uh, yeah, Mary, don't tell Dan. I mean, I'll I'll give it to him the next time I see him because um, he likes Wharf. But uh, yeah, uh, a couple quick links. Um, there you go about the new Bomb Pops record, and then I'm gonna wrap up by just putting up a quick hit if you want to get a little more information about any of those three releases those are links to where you can listen download uh buy them get more information things like that so yeah uh that was that was the first edition of the record shop um let me know if you have things that you might be interested to hear about or talk about in the future i had kind of an idea for the next uh for the next one that is maybe a more uh more deep dive more of a focus explicitly on uh, planetarium related uh, music, music that was maybe used as soundtracks in shows or I've got some geodesium records, stuff like that. Um, so maybe something like that next time or uh, yeah, really anything. I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to kind of share, talk about anything that might be of interest uh, to folks. Um, how am I doing on time, Michael? You've got about two minutes and uh, okay. no slideshow currently showing. Oh, no slide, huh. Um, it should just be a, it's, do you just see me? Is that? No, you, you have a, a window open there. It looks like there's a Windows Explorer window open. Oh, interesting. Um, so, okay, so apparently Windows slideshow uh, does not translate, but uh, maybe we can do it that way. No. No, it looks like you'll have to reshare that, that oh, window. Okay. Let's stop the share. Do, 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 do. Share screen. Nice. There we go. Okay. Excellent. Uh, so better than nothing. Just yeah. Quick rundown. Again, uh, Planisphere. Some weird '80s spacey music. Um, just real chill, piano-driven uh, instrumental pieces on Copia, and then uh, some upbeat pop punk uh, there at the bottom. 
So. All right. Any questions for uh, our our resident uh, record expert, Mike Smale? All right. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, Mike will be back probably uh, once a week, uh, probably the Wednesday conference, uh, with some of his insight into uh, into you know the the music that you should, you should be listening to or something to explore in our our copious amounts of downtime. Uh, and if you thought that was interesting, uh, our next segment, uh, I'd like to welcome Mary Holt from the California Academy of Sciences. Uh, Mary, to her friends, is known as uh, uh, the queen of podcasts. And when you're not listening to us during an e-conference and you want people to talk to you while you're working, podcasts are a fantastic way to do that. So uh, we're going to turn this over to Mary. Uh, this is, and I want to get very important. The title of this segment is the Pandemic Primo Podcast Party for You Planetarian with Mary Holt. <laughs> oh, thank you for that lovely intro, Michael. I do have a slideshow. Let me see if I can figure out how to share this. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that work. Did that work? Yes, okay. All right, so yes, welcome everyone to the first ever edition of Pandemic Primo Podcast Party for Your Planetarian, because I'm a huge fan of alliteration and podcasts. So <laughs> I'm here to uh, share with you some, just a few like highlights of podcasts I think they're amazing. And I literally have like 62, I think I counted podcasts in my phone at the moment. So we won't be getting to all of those today, but hopefully this will be a weekly thing uh, like Smail's uh, record shop as well. So today's episode is brought to you by the Rona and Pocket Casts and as always Squarespace. And let's move on. <laughs> so first of all, podcasts. I'm gonna answer these three questions. Why, with what, and which? Why do you want to listen to podcasts in the first place? How, how do you do that? And which ones should you listen to? And number one, why? Well, most if not all of us are stuck at home right now and there's only so many books, TV shows, games, et cetera, that I can do at least. And I often like to have someone in my ears yammering on at me about a particular thing. And I often talk about that 90% of anything that I know comes from podcasts is my favorite way to just ingest information in general. So I hope to share some of that uh, with all of you. So it has lots of uses. You wanna learn something about science? You wanna laugh at a game show? You wanna hear some lovely brothers playing Dungeons and Dragons with their father? You wanna get away from your roommates and listen to your fake friends and podcasts? You can do that. But how, with what? How do we listen to these wonderful things? Well, my recommendation is Pocket Cast, which is why this episode is brought to you by Pocket Cast. I've been using this app for many years and uh, it's great. It has all the things you might need. It's free, number one, unless you wanna pay. Apparently there's a paid version. I don't know about that, uh, but it's on all the different platforms you could possibly want and has all the things. It has a lovely interface for one thing. You can see like the artwork of the podcast if you want to. It's delightful and cute. Uh, it has a search feature. So if you wanna not listen to any of my recommendations, that's fine. You can go find what you want with the search feature. And it has a queuing thing. So if you're gonna go clean for like two hours and you don't feel like stopping to add another podcast as you go, just queue it up and it's ready for you and it'll just keep going to the next one. And uh, there's filters, I don't use those, but you know, you can do that. Um, and it has a lot of really good uh, uh, controls on it too. Like you can hit a snooze, uh, you can snooze it for in 30 minutes. So it'll play for 30 minutes and then stop. If you wanna be able to sleep by people playing Dungeons and Dragons, you can do that. I maybe do that sometimes. You can skip forward 30 seconds if you don't wanna to listen to ads or you can uh, uh, speed it up if you want your podcast host to sound like a chipmunk. So now that you know how to listen, what do you listen to? Well, I have just a handful of recommendations. This is extremely hard to pick because there's so many good ones out there. Uh, another thing that is known amongst my friends is that I'm known for being like, this is the best podcast I've ever listened to. And I say that about 
a lot of them, but it's true. There's a lot of really good ones. So I'll tell you just a few from a few different uh, genres, starting with the absolute classic that I'm sure many of us know of, This American Life. Started in 1996 on public radio, a young Ira Glass shared with the world wonderful storytelling about people in the United States. And it goes to this day, and there's many different hosts on it too, and it is wonderful and heartfelt. It'll make you laugh, it'll make you cry, it'll make you yell at your phone while you're doing dishes in your kitchen. Um, if you want just some news, my, my go-to for just a daily news is The Daily, um, which is about 20-ish minutes long, and it's every weekday, and it just gives you kind of an in-depth idea of something going on with a particular situation, which of course right now, every almost every single episode is about the coronavirus, but if you want updates on what's going on with the coronavirus, this is a good place to go. Um, but also at the end of every episode, they do a quick summary of a bunch of different news that's gone on in the last day or two. If you don't want news, but you want some science, uh, Science Versus is an excellent go-to. This also has been taken over by the coronavirus recently, but it has a lot of different uh, subjects that it tackles. Every episode is focused on a particular topic and they really uh, research it very well. At the end of every episode, they tell how many citations they've used. And usually it's like a hundred different citations that are used on every single podcast. So it's very well researched and very good and very entertaining. And uh, one that's just kind of a general, really, really good show that I don't even know how to describe. It's just really good. You should listen to it. Um, I actually think this uh, description that The Guardian has here is pretty good. It's just a really good show. And PJ and Alex are like my best friends and I've never met them or talked to them. And I will never tell them that because that's creepy. And <laughs> if you want to so get away from, uh, get a little bit further away from real world stuff, uh, this has a little bit of news. It's based on news, but it's just the classic game show on NPR where you can laugh at things uh, that are going on in the world. And they've been doing a pretty good job, actually. Usually this is uh, recorded in front of a live studio audience. They can't do that right now. But the last episode, they've added like laugh tracks and things, which is just delightful. Um, and then if we want to keep getting even further away from real life, which sometimes is needed. Uh, I highly recommend The Adventure Zone for getting to a separate world. Just these lovely brothers and their father playing Dungeons and Dragons. It's very cute. It's a great time. I often listen to this when I'm going to sleep. And speaking of sleep, I know a lot of us are having trouble sleeping right now. So a podcast that is specifically to help you fall asleep is Sleep With Me. And I've used this in the past when I've been having trouble getting to sleep. And the host is the brother of one of my coworkers, which is a random awesome coincidence that I didn't know for a really long time. And now that I know, I can't unknow it. And I just hear Ken's voice every time I listen to this. But um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that kind of leaves you with a, sh a very quick, but various themed uh, podcast that you can start with. And hopefully in the next few weeks, as we keep doing these weekly, I'll come up with some dumb themes or whatever for each one but that will get you started thank you all for your time <laughs> thanks mary and then uh, of course uh mary has a list of all the podcasts that she's going to discuss each week we're going to post that as part of the comments for the youtube and inside the conference uh event page so that you'll be able to get all of those and and uh uh, and remember them from week to week. But uh, yeah, so something really unique and kind of different and wanted to try to do some some fun with all this. Uh, and since we're now seven minutes ahead of schedule, which is incredible, um, Sorry, we can back. turn this, we'll, we'll open this up to, to open forum to whatever else you guys would like to talk about. Um, if you're interested in hosting a segment like this, uh, not on podcast or music, because we've already taken those um or you know in mark's case mark webb's case was he's now the the host of the virtual hospitality suites uh, we have space for everyone so if you're interested in sharing sort of a non-planetarium aspect of who you are uh this is a, a great opportunity to to share that with the community um real quick i'm going to turn it over to mark for a little bit about uh hospitality suite We've got some cool stuff also, going on this week michael how do i stop sharing <laughs> 
I will take care of that for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> all right, Can, uh, Mark. Yes. All you. Yes. No. No sharing anymore. That's it. Um, so uh, yeah, the the virtual hospitality suite uh, is sort of a, a complement to this series of e conferences that that uh, Michael has put together. Um, it's less formal, less structured. Um, we try to have a little activity to uh, get things going. It's 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 hard to have a hundred people talking at once, so uh, there needs to be a little bit of structure. But um, essentially, it's just a drop-in uh, session to check in and say hi with folks, um, enjoy some laughs and conversation. Um, you're you're free to drink. They're not recorded. Uh, so uh, you, you don't have to, to worry about uh, being preserved forever on YouTube doing something silly. Uh, and it's, it's just a chance to kind of recharge and get, uh, get a sense that the, the real world is still out there somewhere and uh, that your friends are in it. So uh, we invite everybody to, to come and drop by. Um, the uh, the podcast thing is uh, was a really great segment, uh, Mary. Thank you very much. Um, if you are desperate for podcasts, a couple of my favorites are um, one called "Go Fact Yourself," which is a little like "Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me," but it's a, a trivia contest. Where the two celebrity contestants get to choose their areas of expertise and then um, an actual ex expert from that area will come on and uh, judge them at the end. It's very entertaining. Um, that's Go Fact Yourself. The other one is by comedian Paul F. Tom called Spontanean Nation. And it is, I think, one of the most brilliant things that has ever been done in any media where a, a group of improvisers will listen to an interview with a person and then create on the spot an improvised uh, theater piece that uh, is based on the interview and a question asked by the previous week's host uh, or guest rather. Um, it sounds complicated and it is, but it is hilarious. Um, so if you need some laughs, I recommend checking out Spontaneous Nation, Paul Left Tompkins podcast. Um, as uh, Anna mentioned earlier, um, that uh, if some of you weren't here, um, that the time of the virtual hospitality suites, which is tomorrow, Thursday at 8 p.m., is a little difficult for folks in Europe and elsewhere in the world to uh, join in. Um, so we are going to get something set up uh, that will be more time friendly for them. And um, so watch Dome Dialogues for, for that announcement. Um, that's about it for me. Oh, I would like to remind uh, people it's coming up and I'm, I will try to get something up on Dome Dialogues uh, about this today. Um, is that uh, tomorrow and Friday, uh, there will be a conjunction of Venus and the Pleiades. Uh, this is particularly important to uh, the uh, Pawnee cosmology, if uh, any of you remember the show Spirits from the Sky, Thunder on the Land, uh, based on Bondell Chamberlain's uh, research and uh, with the participation of the Pawnee Nation, uh, the Adler Planetarium uh, created this wonderful show. The conjunction of Venus, which in the Pawnee cosmology is bright star, the female spirit mother of, of all, uh, will be visiting the Pleiades, which represents the family and cohesiveness of the, the Pawnee people. So it's it's a very important and symbolic event. If you get a chance to go outside, it should be uh, just slightly north of due west uh, right after sunset. Um, and so if it's clear, 
Uh, Chicago doesn't look that good right now, but if it's clear, go out and uh, take, a, take a quick peek at that. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it back to Michael and uh, we'll go from there. Thanks, Mark. Uh, very happy to uh, announce we already have a new segment for next week. Um, I've been contacted. Uh, Anna Green is going to do the uh, absurdly long German word of the week. So uh, that should be that should be pretty fantastic. Um, really looking forward to that. So yes, if you have something that irreverent that you can add to these conferences, all the better. Uh, anyone else? Um, and at this point, it's open forum, so you can just unmute and talk. It's totally fine. And nobody unmutes. Uh, I, I have uh, unmuted, re-unmuted uh, here. Um, if uh, folks have uh, particularly good April Fool's uh, astronomy-related memes, uh, please post those on the Dome Dialogues, because uh, I'm checking Dome Dialogues several times a day, and I want to see them. So, um, uh, and uh, you know, I, I think it's it's important for us to kind of uh, keep in touch during this time of, of isolation. So, you know, feel free to, uh, you know, post stuff on a regular basis on your Facebook page or uh, through other social media. There was a good one today with the uh, transit of uh, Saturn in front of the sun. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I admit I was fooled by that for a, a few seconds and then like, and, and then I got it and uh, thought that was that was quite wonderful. Patty, you had something. You had your hand up, so I'm, I'm going with that. And then we'll do Toshi. I did, and I was going to reply to somebody, but then I got distracted because, uh, <laughs> uh, well, that whole thing, I didn't get fooled by the transit of Saturn because when I did my transit of Mercury program this year for the public, I posed to them, could there be a transit of Jupiter? So they had to work through that understanding. That was my fake news that we were going to have a transit of Jupiter. So, um, yeah, I was going to say something else really exciting and, and relevant, but yeah, then I got distracted by that. So thanks. <laughs> All right, Toshi, go on ahead. Um, I had a question for Mary, uh, just regarding the podcast app and the, and the Pocket Cast. And I was just wondering what the benefit of using Pocket Cast versus like, um, I have an iPhone, so um, I've just been using sort of the stock um, podcast app. So I was just wondering what the benefit of Pocket Cast over using that is. Um, honestly, I don't entirely know because I've never used <laughs> anything else um but i do know that with pocket cast you can get it on any different like you can get it on an android you can get it on an iphone you can get it on uh there's a desktop app i think um and you can share i think it's easier probably to share with other people if you if both people have it the same app so that might be one reason i don't know if the functionality is much different than like itunes or whatever but yeah Melena. Yeah. Go on ahead. If you had what? anything. I just saw you were no. unmuted. Oh, no, no, no. I'm knitting. The, the power of the unmute button. Um, uh, Mark Percy, go on ahead. I can't hear you, Mark. There I am. Okay. So I just wanted to share a little something. Um, Patty's background with that potato reminded me that the last donuts I was able to get before our local donut shop closed included this, wait, you can't see it. This donut, which <laughs> looks like which Kuiper Belt object? I see the resemblance, yeah. yeah it's now two, nice. two and a half weeks old. I can't bear to eat it, but I had to save that and share it with somebody. So thanks everybody. And that was it, Mark, that the image behind me is actually the astronomy picture of the day, which is their potato uh, version of, of, well, I'm still calling it Ultima Thule. Sorry, I haven't gotten the, the Ar Ar Arakoth. I don't know should if I'm pronouncing that, that right. Into, should I send that into APOD then? Oh, you should. That's hilarious. <laughs> our, uh, our president had a potato that looked suspiciously like uh, Comet 67P. And she kept that thing in Tupperware and pulled it out for like four months to show people. 
It's just, I mean, it's funny, but it's like, it's a suspiciously long time to keep a potato. John, going ahead. Uh, yeah, this was uh, tangential to the presentation earlier on streaming. I just thought of this interesting YouTube video uh, that I saw. Uh, anybody follow Matt Parker, Stand Up Mats? He posted a video called Why Are Talk Show Hosts So Bad at YouTube? And he breaks down why the sound and video quality has been you know, not that great on Colbert when he's broadcasting from his home recently. And he gives three quick tips for making better quality videos. And they're great for beginners. So if you're doing any kind of uh, home casting, I recommend uh, checking out his tips. I'll, I'll post a link in chat. Thank you, John. Anna Green. Oh, Mike Smale, I just wanted to say that um, you're, you're not the only planetarian office that has people that keeps things for a suspiciously long times. So when I worked in uh, St. Louis, there was a can of chocolate frosting, like, like Betty Crocker frosting, that preceded my time there and it was still there when I left. I think it might still be there, which means it is like 12 or 13 years old now. It goes back to Aaron Steinert's time. I can so, I can beat that. I was going through awesome. boxes behind the dome recently, and I found a vintage, empty tray of uh, Lunchables from the '80s. So that was a fun find. Whoa! It was empty, so there was no food in it. Thank God, but it was definitely in a box with like documents from the '80s that had not been touched since then. So super fun things that we decide to hold on to. Anyone else with decrepit food from the 70s, 60s even? Just a little bit of the baby food at the bottom of the jar. Come on, anything, anything. When, okay. when I was at Cernan, we had uh, some Apollo space food. Uh, there were some cheese sandwiches and some applesauce. And by the 1980s, that stuff looked really bad. <laughs> um, so it doesn't last forever. Yeah, last year I was at the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force and also the uh, the Armstrong Museum in Wapakoneta, Ohio, and they both have displays of that the Apollo food, and it it looks rough. It <laughs> it is it has stopped looking like anything but like weird colored dust. Back in my dome, we found a um, a first aid kit that looks like it's from the 60s and you know it has it just yeah it looks like very Apollo era very <laughs> like the box itself is rusting but there's you know things that are labeled antiseptic but uh I I kind of doubt how effective it is now not as old but in 1969 I was in Lafayette Louisiana and had to um <clears throat> uh go on TV and it was during the Apollo missions. And so we were supposed to eat some of that food. We broke it open, we got some. And of course the whole story was, it's not gonna crumble. It crumbled all over the place, <laughs> fell on the floor. All right, well, thank you all for uh for joining us in, in, you know, I think 19, late 1960s is the oldest processed food we've had today. Uh, so if there's kind of a last two minutes, if there's anything anybody else wants to say, um, uh, we will see you officially at an e-conference again uh, Friday, uh, same time, noon. Uh, and then the Zoom, uh, the Zoom, presentation tomorrow night starts seven eastern and then the uh, uh so it's a night class for me it was a little bit like grad school like let's do a night class and then you can go drinking after the class is done uh and yes the ufo does in fact look like a hat but i want to believe uh and so the the last thing we're going to do today uh ken's got one more uh part of the, the 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 mars mission he wants to show off real quick uh and then we'll adjourn so ken take it away
okay, this is the coolest instrument on board the Rover Perseverance. There it is. So where the rover can't go, the helicopter can. <laughs> and this video is available on the Perseverance website, by the way, in case you want to show your audiences this. Sends the data back. Hello. And this is good for your audiences too, to see how they test flight test this equipment before they send it to Mars. Ken, do you happen to know off the top of your head how that's powered? Pardon? How is it powered? Oh, solar power. Got a ray up, up, up the top above the blades. And at this point, I just ask kids, so NASA is pretty cool, huh? <laughs> you know, and what kid doesn't say yes after this? This is pretty neat. So demonstration technology, they're going to fly it on 2020 and incorporate the design into future Mars missions. And of course, uh, next week's segment will be about Dragonfly, which is a mission going to Titan. You know, spoiler alert. So... Very cool. Well, thanks, Ken. And thanks awesome. to everybody for coming out today. It's 2 p.m. That means we're exactly on time for the third straight e-conference. Uh, we'll see you all a little bit later. Take care. And you're all unmuted, so you can say hi. Bye. 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 Bye.